Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Gorman. I started the program. You'll recall I'm a partner at Dorsey & Whitney. This panel is going to focus on issues that relate to the Securities and Exchange Commission. And I should apologize. We're starting a little bit late. We had a couple of technical difficulties here. Everybody's familiar with all that stuff. But without ado, we're going to get moving forward. Let me ask the panel if you would just introduce yourself and give a little bit of background. Jenna, why don't you start? Sure. My name is Jenna Garver. I chair the Investment Management Group for Dorsey & Whitney in the New York office. And my name is Paul Glenn, and I'm an attorney with the Investment Advisor Association here in Washington, D.C. We're the trade association for SEC-registered investment advisors. So if I say a we, that's sort of the context that I'm speaking in terms of. And I started my career at the Securities and Exchange Commission and done other things. But that's my background in short. And plus, it's all in the materials there, so you can look at that. My name is David Lipton. I'm a professor of law at the Catholic University of America. I'm also the director of our securities law program. And gee whiz, if Paul says he comes from the SEC, I'll say that I come from Brooklyn. Brooklyn's a nice place. I come from Cleveland. I don't know if that does anything for the program, but now you know where I'm from. Anyways, we're very fortunate to have these folks here today. Each is an expert in their area. And we have sort of a bifurcated program. The first half, we're going to focus on insider trading for no other reason than pending before the Supreme Court right now is U.S. v. Solomon, which was argued October 5 of this year, and which some people think may be a blockbuster insider trading case, or at least on tipping. And it may be. On the other hand, the last time the court had a blockbuster securities case before it, it wasn't such a blockbuster when the court wrote the opinion. So we'll have to see where that comes out. The second half of the panel, we're going to focus on investment management and investment advisor issues. So it's sort of a bifurcated panel in some senses, although everybody should feel free to comment on what's going on. And we're going to start with Professor Lipton and ask him, David, if you would start talking about insider trading and maybe walk us up to why Solomon might be something really interesting from the Supreme Court. Thanks, Tom. I actually, when I teach, I never read my notes. When I telecast, I do. When I teach, if I say something wrong, I can correct it the next day. When I telecast, I don't have that opportunity. So I will mostly read, but I'll take breaks here and there, and everyone will interrupt me as they please. When Tom asked me to talk about the Solomon, and I added the Newman case, I said, sure, but you really can't talk about it without giving the history and the problems with the insider trading law as it's developed in the United States. In this past year, and moving up to it, the SEC is taking an increasingly aggressive stance toward insider trading. A recently released report for fiscal year 2016 listed its five most important matters that it focused on, and two of them were insider trading cases. This is the enforcement focus. That being so, the SEC and the Justice Department remain somewhat hamstrung by the outcome of the Newman case, which came down late in 2015 in the Second Circuit, where it was found that the government had not adequately demonstrated a breach of duty, which would be necessary to show that the alleged insider trading was unlawful. Now a somewhat comparable case, rising out of the Ninth Circuit, Solomon v. U.S., has been argued, as Tom said, early in October before the Supreme Court. And even if the Justice Department wins this case, as this outside reporter believes it will, it will be necessary for the Supreme Court to further advise as to when a fiduciary duty is breached before there will be a 
hope of removing the hindrance that the Newman case presents. In order to understand the difficulties facing the SEC in justice in pursuing insider trading, it's unfortunately necessary to understand the formation of the court-crafted rules, and that's all that there are, prohibiting insider trading that arise out of Rule 10b-5. We actually don't have a statute dealing with insider trading. We have a statute that we believe deals with insider trading, which is Section 16b of the 1934 Act, and it's a prophylactic statute, which means you don't have to be doing insider trading. It just prohibits three classes of insiders, officers, directors, and 10 percent shareholders, from buying and selling or selling and buying within a six-month period securities of the issuer with which they are related, with which the director, officers, or 10 percent holder have a relationship. It does not concern itself as to whether such insiders actually possess inside information, and more importantly, it doesn't look into whether the trading is based upon any such information. It also is not applicable to non-inside persons who are in the possession of insider trading, which when you look back at some of the more significant Supreme Court cases of the past three decades have really been the subject of the litigation. It also does not cover mere purchase or mere sales. There has to be a purchase and a sale, and that has to occur within, they both have to occur within a six-month period. So it doesn't really refer much to the wrongdoing that the Commission and self-regulatory organizations, primarily the FINRA, seek to eliminate, and which is referred to as insider trading. Well, we all know that there is a rule which we like to think of as the insider trading rule, which is Rule 10b-5, and that is the rule that is used to discourage insider trading, but in truth, the rule does not mention insider trading, nor does its empowering statute, Section 10b, which prohibits only manipulative or deceptive devices in connection with securities transactions. The rule itself is limited to making unlawful in connection with the purchase or sale of any security, any device or scheme to defraud, any practice that would operate as a fraud or deceit, or making an untrue statement of a material fact, or omitting to state a material fact in order to make a statement made misleading. Again, no mention of insider trading. And in fact, when the SEC adopted Rule 10b-5 in 1945, there was no mention of insider trading in the adopting release. That actually is not fair to say, because the adopting release was about nine lines long. This was back when brevity was sufficient. Milton Friedman, who was a star of securities regulatory work years back, recalled, or I should say the late Milton Friedman, recalled in an article that's in an early business lawyer, that when the rule was passed around, no one said anything at all as it was adopted. And rather, the way they adopted it was each of the commissioners read the rule and tossed it down on the table, indicating that they approved the rule. And the only one who said anything was Sumner Pike, from Maine, who, in Bowdoin College, I don't know why that's important to my mind, he did not fight in the Civil War. I went to Bowdoin, just so you know. What's that? I went to Bowdoin. Oh, you did? Yeah, well, then you know all about the Civil War. You can become an SEC commissioner. And the May 20th. There you go. And its role that it played in our neighboring states. Sumner Pike made the comment, well, we are against fraud, aren't we? And that was pretty much it. We know that ultimately the courts did fashion a theory based upon the anti-fraud provision, making insider trading unlawful. But even that theory was not a certain outcome. 
as of 1942. It is of interest to note that it took the commission 27 years from the time of the adoption of the 34 Act to bring its first administrative action against insider trading, the matter of Katie Roberts. And it was not until 34 years had passed from congressional approval that the first fully litigated case on insider trading was handed down by the Second Circuit, SEC versus Texas Gulf Sulphur. In fact, if you look back to state law in the late 1800s and early 1900s, going right up and a little bit past the time of the adoption of the federal securities law, it was believed that inside information, that insiders had no duty not, had no duty to disclose inside information and could buy freely regardless of any informational advantage. The corporate obligation of directors and officers to shareholders did not extend to private dealings with shareholders. In addition, even today, and certainly within the past few decades, a number of legal economists, Manning, Singh, Nguyen, have argued that insider trading is helpful because it provides price discovery and it prepares the market for a tremendous change in market price before the influx of the information that would correct current market price. So what is it then that persuaded the SEC to go forward and to try to develop a case against insider trading with this legacy of law, this long passage of time, the uncertainty of the helpfulness of eliminating insider trading? Insider trading was and is seen as a device that, or an event that destroys the integrity of the market by giving, obviously, a trading advantage to those few with the informational advantage. In other words, while insider trading might assist in the market becoming a more efficient pricing tool, at the same time, it discourages capital investments from those who seek a level playing field in which to trade. Okay, so we move on to saying, well, how did the SEC go from there? To carry out its policy of discouraging insider trading, the Commission in the mid-1960s brought an injunctive action under the anti-fraud provisions of 10b-5 against the mining firm of Texas Gulf Sulphur and 13 officers, directors, and employees to enjoin trading on inside information of securities in the company that had recently discovered a very promising ore drilling basin, which they had proceeded to buy up. The ore was copper and zinc and was perceived to be the largest basin in North America. The Commission also sought rescission from those individuals of securities transactions that had been entered into by the time they brought the case. And these transactions all occurred while the test ore drillings were being made and no disclosure had yet been disseminated to the public. The problem with bringing the action under 10b-5 was the very nature of insider trading is that there is no misrepresentation and there are no fraudulent statements. There are no statements. You go and do faceless trading on a public market or elsewhere without any statement being made. Without a statement, without manipulation, and insider trading does not suggest manipulation, there would seem to be no avenue to demonstrate fraud under 10b-5. But citing to its own administrative action of seven years earlier, Katie Roberts, the Commission argued that Rule 10b-5 is predicated 
on the justifiable expectation of the securities market that all investors have relatively equal access to material information. And you've heard that repeated over and over again in Supreme Court opinions on insider trading right through O'Hagan. The essence of the rule the Commission reasoned, and the Second Circuit agreed in 1968, is that, under Judge Waterman, is that anyone trading for his own account with access to information intended to be available only for a corporate purpose may not take advantage of such information knowing it is unavailable to those with whom he is trading. From this interpretation of 10b-5 arose a duty. And the duty was not to trade on inside information without first disclosing the information to the investment public. You know, abstain or disclose. Disclose or abstain. But, David, if I can interrupt you for just one second. This is a fraud statute. Not telling people something. There's no duty to have that everybody has the same amount of information. I got the information. You don't have the information. So what fraud did I commit by not telling you? You're talking about fairness. The securities markets are not about fairness. They're about fraud. Well, actually, the Commission did argue it's about fairness. But that's neither here nor there. You still have to prove the fraud. And the fraud that was proven was not actual fraud. It was constructive fraud. And constructive fraud arises when there is a breach of a duty and that someone's harmed as a result of the breach of the duty. And the people who are harmed are the people who did not have this information. And it was a demonstration of this duty that became the big bugaboo and remains the big bugaboo surrounding Rule 10b-5. But it is this duty that the Commission relied upon as opposed to a specific statute being promulgated by Congress, though there have been statutes, but they don't directly deal with what is insider trading other than to say it's what you've already collected in your court cases. And then finding that there is a breach of this duty. The existence of this duty became the crux of all charges of insider trading under Rule 10b-5. A duty must always be shown. And each time the insider trading prohibition mutated or grew in scope, the Commission was compelled to demonstrate a comparable duty that encompassed that new activity. As an example, while Texas Gulf Sulphur dealt with insider trading or insiders of a company trading, Dirks versus the SEC dealt with a total outsider trading, and he was a tippee. Now, he happened to have been tipped by an insider, a guy named Ronald Sechrist. Sechrist was an executive officer of an outfit called Equity Funding, a diversified company primarily engaged in selling life insurance and mutual funds. And the size of Equity Funding sales were vastly overstated as a result of a fraudulent corporate practice, ongoing fraudulent corporate practice, engaged in by high-level personnel of Equity Funding. Sechrist, perhaps to alleviate his guilt over his former firm, he was no longer with the firm, over his former firm's fraudulent practices, revealed the firm's activities to Raymond Dirks. Raymond Dirks was a very ebullient investment advisor and broker dealer for a firm that did advisory firm for institutional investors in insurance. He was short and quite squat, and he was known to jump up on tables and promulgate his views to the crowd and get them to join in his enthusiasm. 
Dirks did not own any equity funding. The firm did not own any equity funding. But while he was investigating the validity of this information, said, told to him by Sechrist, which he felt he had to do or be caught with a lawsuit, Dirks openly discussed the information he had obtained with several clients and investors, some of whom proceeded to sell their holdings of equity funding prior to its deep slide. Well, was that insider trading? It certainly wasn't the insider trading that we had seen in Texas Gulf Sulphur. It was an outsider. The outsider had been tipped by an insider. And the Supreme Court, in deciding this matter, I believe that Dirks actually went to prison before the Supreme Court's ruling came down. I'm not certain about that. I meant to research it. No, I don't think he did. You don't think he did? No? Okay. I'll go with your recollection on that. The Supreme Court cited to Chiarella v. The United States, which, like the Second Circuit's Texas Gulf Sulphur decision, this was a Supreme Court decision, held that a breach of fiduciary duty must be found for there to be a violation of 10b-5. The problem was, as I said, that Dirks was not an insider. And so he had no duty to the firm. So the Supreme Court devised a new test for a breach of fiduciary duty when the tippy is not an insider but has learned his information from a tipper who was an insider. And even though Sechrist no longer was with the firm, he was still considered an insider for some period of time. And that test was that the tipper must have breached a duty to the firm, and the tippy would inherit the information, would inherit the tip, and inherit the breach if he knew that the tipper had, in fact, breached his duty to the firm. The court explained that the tipper commits his breach only by tipping inside information for personal gain. And the court went on to define personal gain, which proved to be very helpful, at least in the Newman case and also in the argument of the Solomon case. The personal gain was defined as pecuniary gain or reputational benefit that could translate into future earnings. And that was interpreted as future earnings for either side, either the tipper or the tippy. In addition, and this made it easier, at least in Solomon, which did involve close friends and family, and family to be. In addition, the court specified that the tipper will exploit non-public information when he makes a gift of confidential information to a trading relative or friend. And there it did not speak about it maturing into future earnings. Unfortunately for the government, Sechrist's motives in disclosing this inside information to Dirks arose from a sense of moral indignation or perhaps shame, not the desire to benefit himself. Dirks, therefore, was found not to be liable for insider trading. After Dirks, there was one more fiduciary duty that needed to be defined by the court. And this last one, the misappropriation theory, may provide a clue as to how the Supreme Court can resolve the Newman problem in answering the Solomon case. Newman is not before the court. For some time, it was recognized that insider information does not always come directly from the company being traded. There is valuable market information about such companies that was confidential, but that came from the outside. So a printer's knowledge, as in Chiarella, of a tender offer schedule 
that he worked on for the bidder would provide valuable market information about the subject of the offer if he were able to figure out the code, which Chiarella was, the code for the subject company. The same was true about a lawyer's knowledge of a tender offer on which he was working. It was in the latter instance, a lawyer with knowledge about a tender offer upon which knowledge he traded, that the Supreme Court developed its final fiduciary duty theory. It's final in terms of what we've seen to date. The breach of which could give rise to 10b-5 fraud violation for trading on inside information. Since the information in a misappropriation, the printer with the lawyer, the lawyer getting it from the bidder, the printer getting it from a schedule that the bidder was preparing, since the information did not come from the firm, the duty could not arise by a breach of duty to the subject firm. Rather, it had to be in connection, rather it had to be a breach of duty in connection with the purchase or sale of securities. That court held that under a misappropriation theory, the deception may arise through the defendant's deception of anyone, deception of anyone who is the source of the information upon which the defendant is trading or his tip B is trading. So long as the recipient of the inside market information owed a fiduciary duty to that source. And the printer at Chiarella owed that duty and the lawyer owed that duty to his firm and to the client. And in trading on that information, the lawyer breached its duty and the court explained that the misappropriation theory is part of the animating purpose, their words, I wouldn't use such a fancy term, of the Exchange Act, which is to ensure honest securities markets and thereby promote investor confidence. Again, that notion of we are looking for a fair market. If the market is populated with transactions based upon misappropriation, some investors will refrain from dealing altogether. Again, those were the words of the Supreme Court. Well, all of this, as you see, becomes rather complicated, but it is the background to both the Newman holding and the Solomon case, Solomon case, now before the Supreme Court. One wonders if it is not time to think about a simpler anti-insider trading provision, such as what the EU directives provide, which merely hold that you may not trade when in possession of non-public information, regardless of how it is obtained, period, Article 3. The problems with finding the occurrence of insider trading were exacerbated in U.S. v. Newman. In Newman, two different traders did trade on different inside information about two different firms, Dell and the other one was Nabita, the securities of which were the subject of the transactions in question. But the evidence provided was insufficient to prove that the tippers gained a personal benefit in making the tips. The information was originally transmitted to a friend, not a family member. So there wasn't this close relationship that you could use and you could say, oh, gosh, you know, this family member, we don't have to worry whether it matures into a financial gain. The Second Circuit held that there was not the close personal relationship, which might represent at least a potential gain or a pecuniary or similar valuable nature. There was no intention to benefit the tippee either. There was no history of loans that the tipper had made to the tippee. There were no history of personal favors between the tipper and the tippee, which might suggest that the passage of this information was a continuation of that relationship. That didn't exist in Newman. By the time the information got to the actual traders, 
one being Newman, the other one being Chaser. They were sufficiently distant from the initial tipper-tippy interaction to be able to argue that they were unaware that they were trained on information obtained from insiders or that the insiders received any benefit in exchange of such disclosure. And the Second Circuit was able to thus conclude that the actual traders knew next, their words, next to nothing about the insiders and their relationship with the tippees. U.S. v. Solomon is sort of at the other end of the spectrum. This case revolves about the exchange of information regarding upcoming mergers and acquisitions from a tipper who worked with an investment bank involved in certain transactions, namely mergers and acquisitions. But unlike Newman, the tipper and tippees were close. They were either family members, about to become family members. There was a sister who was going to marry one of the tippees, or very close friends. In addition, there was a history between the tipper and the initial tippee, which was his brother, of exchanging information that knowingly had financial value to the tippee. And so this giving of information was a continuation of that. And in fact, at one point when the tippee was going to college, the tipper took care of his expenses in college. So giving information was a continuation of that history. The ultimate trader knew full well of the source of the trading. So he knew about the relationship between the tipper and the tippee. It wasn't that he didn't know that they were close, didn't know that information had been exchanged, and didn't know that financial favors were being given from one brother. I believe it was the younger to the older. So where do we go from here? Let's assume that the Supreme Court agrees with the Ninth Circuit and holds Solomon liable for insider trading. Big deal. We are back to tipper-tippee fiduciary duty. We are back to perhaps a misappropriation theory. But it doesn't tell us how far this kind of chain of passing information may go and still satisfy the tipper-tippee violation or the elements of the violation or satisfy misappropriation. Perhaps a resolution might be if the Supreme Court would rely exclusively on misappropriation and not on the classical tipper-tippee theory. And in that instance, one might be able to say to the ultimate trader, look, you know that this information is inside information. You know that it must have come from somewhere. There is a presumption that you're aware of the misappropriation. And at least in civil cases, you might go on that presumption. I think it might be difficult in criminal cases. And if you end up with inside information in your hands given to you by someone, you start out with the presumption that you are trading on misappropriated inside information. Since it would be a presumption, it could be rebutted. The trader would have to demonstrate that he was sufficiently untrained in investment practices to understand that his information had to be misappropriated. And perhaps that creates a whole spider web of intricate problems which would have to be walked through. And though that might be so, it's sort of where we currently are with the fiduciary duty test. Perhaps the best bet would be to forget about the court crafting our insider trading rule and have Congress adopt a statute 
not dissimilar from the EU's directive on market issue abuse. And I'll read that statute to you and end with the reading of that statute. Insider trading, recommending or inducing another person to engage in insider trading. Member states shall take the necessary measures to ensure that insider dealing, recommending or inducing another person to engage in insider trading, as referred to in paragraph 2 through 8, constitutes criminal offenses, at least in serious cases and when committed intentionally. And if you go through 2 through 8, you see a great many scenarios that we're familiar with. But you do see one that we're not entirely familiar with. And it reads, this article also applies to any person who has obtained inside information under circumstances other than those referred to in the first subparagraph, 2 through 8, where that person knows that it's inside information. And that's very similar to developing a presumption that you know that it's inside information and you trade on it, you're going to be liable. End of my sermon. Well, let me ask you one question. The government argued in Solomon that if you got inside information and I transmit it to somebody, okay, and I know, should have known, was reckless in not knowing, or any of the other variations of knowledge that the government comes up with, that they're going to trade, you're liable. No benefit, no gift, no nothing. That's it. They said that's dirks. The justices seemed a little skeptical, but what do you think? I missed it, Tom. Are you saying that there was no pecuniary interest to the tipper in that instance? No. Yeah, I was listening to the oral arguments this morning, and I do agree with you that the justices dismissed that. And I don't recall exactly how they dismissed it, whether it was with a contradictory statement or just a sort of passing, okay, let's move on. But I don't think that's something the justices took very seriously. I do know that Roberts and Breyer both were asking for a dividing line, say, give us a line where this ends. Well, isn't one of the common threads dirks drew a line in the sand? They said not every transmission of inside information is insider trading. Some are, some aren't. And that's where they came up with this personal duty stuff. Newman said, hey, these guys are third and fourth tier tippees. Never, never, and this is almost a quote from the case, never has a criminal insider trading case been brought with somebody that far out. Solomon in the Ninth Circuit, interestingly written by our good friend Judge Rakoff in the Southern District. Because the Ninth Circuit didn't have enough judges. Yeah, that's right. So he went out there. They don't have a dividing line like that. They pushed back on it. But then the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court during the argument seemed to be saying, well, you know, what if I'm in the bar and I'm having a couple drinks and, you know, I just blurt this junk out and, you know, and won't the SEC at least, the DOJ can't get away with this probably, but the SEC could say, you should have known that he was going to trade, so we're going to sue you. Yeah, well. Which is what Sotomayor argued. Yeah, I think it's difficult to say that you made that disclosure under the influence for pecuniary gain. And there has been a case of that sort, and it was a football coach. I'm not being a Major League football fan. Barry Switzer. Yes, thank you. Where he was in the stands and quite inebriated and said something like, we're going to run over the opposition just like such and such outfit is going to run over this company in an acquisition. And it was held that, no, that wasn't intentional. You know, that wasn't insider trading. It might have been stupidity, but I'm not sure we have a criminal action against stupidity. Well, we have 
certainly lots of civil action to it. It only took four or five years of litigation for him to get out of that case. But at any rate, we will see where the Solomon case comes out, probably sometime this spring. It is probably the most anticipated insider trading case, at least in a long time. We'll see if they draw a line in the sand or if they go with the government. One of the comments from Sotomayor was the defendant's position was too far. One of the comments from one of the other justices was the government's going too far because both of them claimed that they were poor square in accordance with Dirks. Obviously, not everybody does. Maybe they'll wait for the ninth justice. We need to do one public service thing, and then we're going to switch topics and talk about investment management. So if you're in New York and you want CLE, this is the code. We get to do it twice, and if you miss writing it down, sorry. New York will come and get me if I tell it to you again. So it's WKZ, as in zebra, 294. That's WKZ294. Write that down. You get CLE credit in New York. Every place else, you don't need that number. So now we're going to move to and talk a little bit about investment management. And one of the things that happens with investment advisors and now PE firms, because they're now getting regulated by the SEC, unlike years past, is they have to put up with the inspection people, OC, as they're called, by people in the trade, Office of Inspections and whatever that stands for. Some people think that things have changed. Inspections used to be sort of cooperative. Now they seem to be turning into enforcement investigations, which is a whole different place to deal with the SEC. Jenna, you do these things. What do you think? What do I think? Well, I think a lot of that is true, unfortunately, although exams are a separate process than enforcement. There is more overlap than there had been before. So it's not unusual to have enforcement sit in on exams and participate early on in the process now. That does not always indicate that there is a problem or that an enforcement action is forthcoming. They could be sitting on for training purposes. That's always what we like to think, hope for the best, that it's just for training purposes. But it certainly is true. And what we're seeing, too, is that there's so much more enforcement activity than before. I mean, it's a lot. I think it's up 34 percent over a 10-year period or something very significant like that, that enforcement has become the way to regulate. So even outside the exam context, clients will look to enforcement activities to learn how they should be implementing their compliance programs. And that's especially true in the private fund context. So in the past year, we saw numerous private equity firm enforcement actions, and private equity clients were actually learning through those procedures what would be okay and what would not be okay and went back and evaluated their current compliance programs to see if they needed to be updated or looked back at their past practices to see if they had any violations, which were industry standard at the time, but through these enforcement actions, they've come to find out that they no longer pass muster with the SEC. So that's really what we've been seeing. In the exam context in particular, the days of presence exams, so the post-Dodd-Frank private fund advisor exams, like long gone. The exams I'm seeing now are reminiscent of pre-Dodd-Frank exams, which are like full-on exams. I think last year when we were here, I said some of the exams I was seeing were specific to certain practices within private equity, and I think that was stemming from the presence exams and honing in on certain practices that they really wanted to get more information on. But now we're just seeing much broader exams. So I've had multiple clients with exams that lasted more than six months this past year with more than 100 items in the document and information requests. So much more detailed. I think generally just dovetailing on our insider trading discussion, although from our 
compliance regulatory side as opposed to the enforcement side, as I said last year, the arguments in front of the Supreme Court are somewhat academic because from a compliance standpoint, it's that you just don't engage in insider trading. Let's not get into whether or not you have a benefit. Like you just don't misuse material and public information. I mean, that is really the flavor of an insider trading policy, a registered investment advisor. But on the exams, what we're seeing is just they have all of this new software and they're just so excited to use it that they're requesting a ton of data, looking farther back than they've ever looked before. So trade blotters, all their trading activity, and that's just taking a lot of time to prepare in the manner in which the SEC wants it in the required field so they can then plug the raw data into their software algorithms to look for potential market manipulation. Jenna, just to add a comment in support of what your conclusion was and what you're observing, the SEC had reached out to the Investment Advisor Association and wanted to talk to people in the private equity community in New York. And I don't know if you were in that meeting or not, but I got reports back from it that said, whoa, we were really surprised that they really seem to be coming in to do all their examinations of private equity with some specific intention of what to do. It was almost like they were an arm of enforcement. And they said, if we come in, we've got a reason for being there. And, of course, you can ask them what it is, but they may or may not tell you. But it endorses your observations. Isn't this really, if you turn these things into enforcement investigations, isn't this really changing the whole atmosphere? I mean, traditionally, the inspections were supposed to be more on a cooperative basis. You had a duty to give them this stuff. You had a duty to sit down and talk to these guys. The compliance people weren't being prepped to testify. They weren't being represented necessarily by outside counsel who would defend an enforcement action. So isn't this really changing the way this whole process works? Yeah, we had an opportunity to talk with the head of OC, which is separate from what we're talking about here, the people focusing on private equity. But they still hold to that position, that it's an examination, inspections. And they said it's sort of a bell-shaped curve, 10 percent no action at all, and 10 percent goes to enforcement, roughly. So they still consider it in that area, but it does have in the private equity a more intensity to the flavor that it has. Sure, if you've got an enforcement observer sitting there, he or she's going back to her assistant director and saying, hey, you know, we might have this new case over here, as opposed to, wow, there's a problem, and maybe we can figure out how to fix it, and maybe you get a deficiency letter. I mean, this is a different, we're talking different planets here, aren't we? Well, we haven't gotten into change of venue, I mean, change of leadership at the SEC, which we've talked about in some of the other panels. But with Mary Jo White as being head of the SEC, I think she's the longest-serving chairman I read recently. But anyway, she does have a flavor on the investment advisor area, and two things to observe. One is the no case is too small to bring with a broken window, so that sort of overlays everything. You could always be sued for the smallest of actions. But the second one is she says she can't sleep too well at night if there aren't more examinations, because they're afraid of another Madoff going on. So there's a strong pressure on the SEC to examine or inspect, maybe I should say, although they say exam, inspect more investment advisors so that they get the percentage up. Right now, I think it's going to go over 10 percent, and it could go with all the things that happen as high as 14 percent, and it's gotten down as low as 7 or 8 percent under Mary Shapiro. But in order for credibility, I think certainly our organization and others feel that there's an intellectual responsibility to have enough inspections so that to add to the credibility and safety and soundness of that particular industry. So I don't know that anybody would argue that you shouldn't have inspections, but does this emphasis on broken windows, and we'll come back to that in a second, but does that kind of an approach dictate that 
maybe instead of everybody just saying, yeah, here's my people, we can interview them, it's like, no, 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 we'll bring in a bunch of defense lawyers and everybody's going to lawyer up and everybody's going to do that, which is going to make the staff real unhappy if you do that. And it'll really slow down the exams and reduce the number, yeah. of course. Yeah, and they'll label you as uncooperative. Well, and we don't, I mean, really do that unless we as counsel for these clients have good reason to think that we're heading towards enforcement. That's not to say that we add to. Obviously, Tom, we work very closely on these exams, even the most routine ones, because we have to be thinking a few steps ahead just in case, um, you know, strategically. But, you know, we wouldn't necessarily lawyer up, um, you know, in a, you know, in person with a routine interview and an in-person exam. In fact, as part of outside counsel, one of our biggest responsibilities is making sure that the chief compliance officer is confident and knowledgeable enough to be able to conduct the exam and lead the exam you know, with the assistance of counsel, which the SEC, of course, they know that the chief compliance officer or general counsel is in contact with us, but we want to show that they have uh, a, you know, a show of force internally to really be the voice of compliance and set the tone. So as part of the exam process, it's a little bit of a balancing act of, you know, in the background, what are we doing to really focus on the strategy to not, you know, go as far as we would perhaps if there were a legitimate concern towards enforcement, but always be prepared because you never know with a broken windows. I mean, clients always say, you know, should I be worried here? I'm like, well, I couldn't really tell you that because if nothing's too big or nothing's too small, everything's game. It, it, it really, it just wastes so much energy in trying to get through the process in a collaborative and, and way and, you know, just not have clients totally stressed out uh, through the process. But I do think that generally the exams, unless there have been really material issues, have been pretty smooth. Um, tone is really important. Cooperation is really important. Responsiveness, I think, is the most important thing. They want to know that you can answer their questions quickly and get their documents to them quickly and in the, the manner in which they want them. And so exam prep, I think, goes a long way to avoiding going to enforcement for little things. Um, what we've also seen, we've had clients that have had issues, but clients that have addressed those issues as they've come up, either before the exam or if they have found something during the document production process for the exam, remediating the problem quickly and appropriately and documenting that response has really it served clients well when it comes time for a deficiency letter. I've had clients where they have had significant issues but have dealt with them to the point where there's not much left to put in the deficiency letter other than we talked about this and you fixed it and you know that doesn't really serve anyone at that point. So I always say like if you find a problem don't panic about it. You know, talk to counsel if you can resolve it, wrap it up with a bow and say, we handled this, I did my job, you don't have to do anything further. I think that really helps and we've seen a number of those examples this year. Um, but I still do get Tom involved early on just to make sure because that is the environment we're currently in. And I don't know if that is really going to change. I think the, and I don't, I, don't, I was, joking with Paul earlier. Um, I feel like everyone's got tea leaves. I don't know where they're buying them from. I can't see them myself, but um, I have heard that the broken windows thing may not be, you know, as prominent going forward. Um, but that exams will, I mean, look, right now we're at 10%, 11%, I think this past year, it's up 10% for the prior year. You know, that's not that many exams uh, for a regulated industry. So I don't know how low that number realistically would go with this change of administration. Um, it obviously will come down to budget, as it always does. So who has the resources to conduct these exams? That being said, they've gotten really savvy at doing more desk exams. So even with a low budget, there are still ways for them 
to get in there and do something. So I don't think we're going to see a big dial back on that. And the SEC likes to make the point that actually everyone is examined is just with how much depth because of all the screenings they do and the review that they do of all the, you know, what your investment plans are. And a lot of this is spelled out in your form ADB that you have to make available to clients and therefore the SEC. It's all available on the, what they call the IARD system. So people can go read those to see what the fees are and how they invest and what their strategies are and so forth up to a point. And so that helps them assess the risk. So if it's plain, simple, and vanilla, you might not get examined for 10 years. I say 10 years, it really actually goes past that sometimes, but they now have a program to try to get everyone at least in that 10th year, if not before. So, Paul, you mentioned broken windows, which for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's an enforcement theory that the current chair, Mary Jo White, borrowed from the New York City Police Department. Nothing's too small to prosecute. We prosecute anything we can find. That's the idea. And that may tell you why the enforcement stats are off the charts these days. But whether it stays or not, we've got cases on the books and cases in the works. F squared, for example, how much due diligence is due? Is that one of these cases? Maybe you can talk about that. Thank you, Maria. That is one that I wanted to talk about because under F squared, that was a case that the SEC brought in 2014. And the thing I'm aiming at is it was a recent case. In the last few months, it was brought against, well, 13 different cases all announced in one announcement against 13 different companies because they had used data that had come from F squared without doing more due diligence on it. But the question – Back up and tell us what the problem is. Yeah, I know, I know. So here's what happened. The F squared case was sort of out of the Boston area, and they had had a strategy that they thought would be good to apply, and they had these statistics that said, you know, they would beat the standard poor 500 by, you know, 200 or 300 basis points, and so everybody should be using their strategy. Well, as it turns out, the data that they had used in order to create that was created in retrospect. So it was after the fact, and they went back, and what was unknown to people was that they would put what I call pivot points a week before all the changes in the market. So it would look like you made these timely investment changes, and each time it was ratcheting up instead of, you know, the typical up and down. So that was what they had done. So the SEC brought a case against them, and they held them liable. But then two years later, they sort of glommed together a number of these cases against 13 companies, investment advisor firms, that had used these strategies. Well, the point was they didn't give any extra disclosures about it, and they hadn't done any extra due diligence. I heard from counsel that one of them did some due diligence, but that wasn't enough to dissuade them from bringing the case against them, and they're thinking of bringing cases against others. So there may be more that come out on this. So anyway, in our fall compliance workshop in Boston, the regional administrator, the head of investment management, and the head of enforcement were on a panel at the noon hour, and they talked about this issue. And some questions from the audience said, well, what would you expect people to have done? You know, what should they have done? For example, if we were looking at data from Morningstar, would we have to question that? And they said, no, you wouldn't have to do that, but their point is you have to do something. Well, what is a something? I had a chance to, you know, meeting a non-public one, so there's nothing to be ascribed here, but the head of OC, I asked him what I just told you, and he said, this is totally my words, but the essence was, well, a person needs to identify the risks and mitigate them to the level that you're comfortable with. It's a typical mantra, so to speak, for regulation. So the point is you need to do something. The reason I'm telling you this is because nobody knows exactly what's sufficient, so there's no comfort area, and when you're getting sued for using data that somebody else did incorrectly, that really is a sort of sort of Damocles that could fall on you at any time without you knowing what's coming, if so it would seem. So that's an issue I wanted to bring to people's attention. I encourage them to do something. One of the other questions that's been raised, and there's no clear answer on it, well, what if they're 
GIPS compliant, generally accepted investment, international investment standards. And what if that's verified? Is that enough? Well, if you don't even ask about it and you don't look at it and you don't see if it's verified, you don't have anything to rely on. That's the problem. So maybe it would be okay if you consider it okay. In other words, you have to define what level of due diligence you think is necessary in situations like this and then make sure that you're following it, at least in order to have an argument that you didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, but aren't these cases, they're charging these things as negligence. Or a disclosure question. Or a disclosure question. But unlike, say, a corporate director where there are well-defined standards of negligence, you have monitoring duties under Delaware law, and you really have to sort of screw up to turn out to be negligent. Here they just go, negligent. And you go, and the standard is where? Well, I know we don't have any Supreme Court cases on this either. You know, it's being made up as they go along in a certain sense, which is sort of a scary standard. Also, back to notice and opportunity for comment in the first panel. Right. And isn't this, don't we see the same sort of things in the PE area? Yeah, I mean, I think just to stay on escort for a second with the negligence claim, I mean, in some of these contexts, you know, you have a primary advisor, sub-advisor relationship where the primary advisor is responsible for monitoring the performance of the sub-advisor or the licensed algorithm software or what have you. And I think some of the cases involving the F-squared performance data, it was pretty clear that they could have done a little bit more. Some of the cases, I think we all agree, are just completely frustrating because we just know that whatever they did wasn't enough, but we don't know what would be enough. But other cases, it is kind of clear that, like, literally nothing was done. And I believe that the company was formed in 2008. I might get these dates wrong, but I think it was 2008. And the data went back to 2000 or 2001. So, of course, it had to be hypothetical back-tested data. It couldn't be live data because the company didn't exist at the time. And perhaps it was ported from another entity, but nobody bothered to make that connection in that one particular case. So I can understand where, you know, as an advisor, you do have a duty, of course. You hear fiduciary duty all the time. So you do need to do your homework when you're delegating to a sub-advisor. The SEC has provided a lot of guidance on that point, and a lot. But the only thing they haven't said is what would be enough to verify third-party performance data. And, you know, I think there's a lot of frustration on this point. People generally get frustrated with things, but this, I think, is kind of a boil-over point. And it certainly makes it hard for us to guide clients. I would love just to be able to pick up the phone and say, yes, SEC, please tell me, because I have these clients that are trying to do the right thing, and they would like to do something. We've seen this with a number of different issues. Custody rules don't get me started. I find that that is the perfect example of I'm trying to do the right thing. Will you please just let us know what your thoughts are on this process? But that's not how it works. In the private equity space, what we've seen is intense focus on fees and expense allocation and disclosure of conflicts of interest. There have been, I think, at least six to eight cases this year on fees and expense allocation issues alone. And this is pure follow-the-money activity in an exam process. They'll look at the general ledger. It's one of the first things they're going to ask for. Just give me the money trail. And they'll look to see all the ways the money came in and out and how it was allocated, and they'll go line by line and compare that against the disclosure and the fund documents and just general fairness principles as well to see how those items were allocated and whether that's vertically or horizontally, so it's between the private equity manager and the fund or between the multiple funds and co-investment vehicles of the fund manager. And, you know, that, too, is where we see a lot of this regulation through enforcement because the fees and expense disclosure language has evolved over time, but, you know, 
in somewhat recent history, it was pretty vague. That's not necessarily a good thing. But managers were afforded a lot of latitude, and especially in the private equity context where some of those funds may still be kicking. You know, their language may be somewhat out of date now, but the fund is closed. They're not taking in new money, and it's living the course of its life. So dealing with the new regulatory environment with old documents, the industry has just changed so fast, that could be a bit of a challenging exercise. And conflicts of interest, too. We've seen a lot of activity on that front. I think private equity just got hammered with enforcement this year. But I think going forward, frankly, it's sort of the hedge funds, I think, could be next. Again, I don't have the tea leaves, but I think things like insider trading and other hot topics are getting pretty ripe, that I wouldn't be surprised if we saw more activity on that front. But again, I'm totally speculating. So one last question, since we're running over time. So Mary Jo White stepping down in January. My guess, I'm sure that Chesa Ray, her enforcement chief, is going with her. That leaves three open slots on the commission right now. What happens in the age of Trump? Do we see these trends continue? What are clients supposed to think about all of this? Is enforcement going to get slacked off? The Republicans are going to cut all the money? Well, what we see on the commission front is working from the back end. There's two people that have already been approved in a certain sense, but they haven't come to a vote in the Senate. And that's Lisa Fairfax, the Democrat, and Peirce for the Republicans. Peirce will probably still be on track to become a commissioner. She has the full support of Senator Shelby. And Lisa Fairfax, it's debates about whether or not even all the Democrats support her. There was some thought, well, at least, well, PV Bar is there. Whether he'd be promoted or not, maybe not, but he might. But there'll be a new chairman that will be designated by the president. And like you said, they'll have to come up with three. And plus, they all have to be approved by the approval of the Senate. So how that works its way through, and it's pretty close to the Senate is. And if something isn't coming up for a vote, it just doesn't get voted on. So that's one of the issues that they've been seeing so far. So we don't see it happening before January 20 or thereafter. But the head of the transition team is Paul Adkins, who is the chairman and founder of Potomac, P-O-T-O-M-A-K, I think is his firm. And Dan Gallagher is the president there, and some thought that he might go back to be chairman. There's other names that we've heard as possible, too. None of them, there's no clear answer as to who it would be. But Adkins did go up last week or the first of this week to talk to Trump in New York as to what their plan is. So we don't know the answers on it. That's what will happen. We don't see a lot happening until they get those commissioners there. We were talking earlier, P.B. Barra said he's not going to vote on anything that's substantive until they get approved, letting mutual funds give electronic disclosures to their investors. So that's some things we've heard, but other people could hear. It would probably be other ears to the ground. And I won't speculate on picks or, frankly, what could or could not happen next year on a regulatory front. But one thing I think is just worth mentioning, regardless of what happens next year, I mean, if you have a complete dial back of Dodd-Frank or something in the middle or nothing at all, the private fund industry has developed its own standards. And, again, regardless of what happens on the regulatory side, this is an industry that developed particular standards even before Dodd-Frank. And we would expect that a lot of the best practices that have been developed from before Dodd-Frank and straight through it would continue because institutional investors are going to continue to make demands on the fund managers, whether or not they are registered. 
And I think that in terms of integrity in the industry, that's a good thing. So regardless of whichever way the political wind is blowing, there still maintains this integrity in the industry because the institutional investors have a duty to the beneficiaries, especially in terms of pension plans, state plans, and what have you. Anybody else? One last thought, and then we'll wrap this up. There is one other looming prospect that people don't talk about. On the transition team is Ralph Ferrara. Ralph was a former SEC general counsel, but he started in enforcement. So if Ralph gets in there, which I think Ralph would be interested in that job, you may continue with the kind of enforcement trends. Maybe not broken windows, but I would expect to see a lot of these trends continue. So with that. If I had to describe the way it used to be and the way it is now, like you said, anything can be a trigger for a case. But in the older days when some of us were at the division of enforcement, they'd look for the big frauds, and then they'd add in all the other charges. But it's sort of turned on its head right now. So I don't know if that old way would be better than the new way, but they're still looking for frauds. They were still looking for frauds, and they were charged then, and they're charged now with making law through enforcement actions. So we'll see where that all goes. Anyway, I'd like to thank our panel for participating today. I'd like to thank everybody for listening in. I know we're a little over time, but thank you, and have a good night.